happen though once we get going. Welcome everybody to I believe what is our 10th sustainable CT coffee hour of the year. My name is Alyssa Norwood and in a moment I want to give everyone from the sustainable CT, CT team who's here a chance to introduce themselves but as we so often do on our coffee hours just so that we know everybody who is in the room not just by name but by town affiliation. If you go to your um, your picture on Zoom in the top right hand corner, you'll see three little dots. If you click on those, there's an option to click rename. So we're all cozy here. You're welcome to keep your last name, but if it doesn't fit, you could just keep your first and then a little hyphen afterwards with the town that you're affiliated with um, or alternatively your organization if you're not here in a town capacity. Um, so with that, I'm gonna popcorn it over to Torin, who I know already introduced himself. Torin, why don't you introduce yourself and then pass it off to the next sustainable CT person you see. Hey, everybody, I am the website manager for Sustainable CT, so if you have any questions, comments, or concerns about the website, this is the face behind it. I'm going to pass it over to Jim. Thanks, Torin. Yeah, Jim Hunt, I'm the communications manager for Sustainable CT, so if you have any issues with communication, um, seriously, you know, I'm, I'm the guy. So who else is here? Lynn is here. Hi, Lynn. Let's pass it over. Good morning, to everyone. Hi, Lynn Stoddard, um, Executive Director of Sustainable CT. Great to see everyone. Uh, we... let's see Chad. Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Chad, and I'm a program assistant with Sustainable CT. So, general sustainability program related things come my way. And I'll pass it over to Alyssa. Thanks everyone. So as you know, some of you, um, this might be your first coffee hour from the names I see here. For most folks, you are all veterans. So this is hopefully a familiar and comfortable space, but I'll just reiterate that these are for you. Um, they're conversations and dialogues as much as their presentation. You know our motto is by towns for towns and we select topics responsive to what you tell us is most helpful. Some aspects of this are more planful and some are more organic. Organic, um, regardless of how things um, evolve for you and what brought you here, um, make sure that you're active participants in shaping both today's conversation and also those in the future. We have one more planned for this year. That's next month. We've yet to select our topic. We'll advertise it soon, but this is also a space if there are things that you want to hear more about. Um, we're happy to, to shape the next coffee hour so as to make sure that they meet your needs. So we have a couple of different goals for today. Um, and the first one is there's one staff person who we've not yet introduced, and that's Joseph Dickerson. So Joseph, um, I'm going to turn things over to you so you can um, introduce yourself in your new role at Sustainable CT. Uh, uh, sure, I think. Can everyone hear me? Sometimes never quite sure. Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Joseph Dickerson. I'm um, really excited to join the Sustainable CT team. Um, it has now uh, been one month and one day. Um, I see some folks that I have actually already had a chance to uh, speak with and connect with. And so, um, Kristen, good to see you. Um, and, uh, and so I'm looking forward to meeting a lot more um, of the both the, the town side of folks, but also the community, um, community leaders. I think that one of the great uh, factors about how the Community Match Fund works is that it, it has a close partnership with, um, uh, with the town certification side. And, and our goal is to really help make those partnerships work and partnerships really matter. Um, both to the towns and also to the project leaders. I think, you know, many of you, you know, wherever you happen to be, you've got a lot of folks in your towns that are doing really great work and we want to support that, incentivize um, people to continue doing that. And for the towns to get recognized for it as well um, in helping to, uh, to get those projects up off the ground. So um, I'm excited to be able to help facilitate that. Um, I have a background in sort of uh, working for, um, at a community development level. Um, uh, in grad school, I ran a uh, GIS, which was a, a geographic information system database that tracked neighborhood 
indicators that focused on what were the in instruments and what were the uh, factors that were making a town um, sort of uh, grow, making the real estate market grow, making um, meaningful impacts in people's lives on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, so it's just been really exciting to be able to see some of that experience um, translated into um, being able to run the community match fund. Um, prior to, to working here with uh, Sustainable CT, um, I ran uh, the community bike shop program um, it, called BCCO in Hartford. And um, I really uh, started that program up from the ground up and um, actually we were um, one of the community match fund uh, grant awardees, uh, which was really exciting um, to kind of go from uh, one side of the house uh, to the other um, now that I'm working here. So that's a little bit about me. I, uh, I mountain bike, uh, I love mountain biking. Um, huge, uh, huge into fly fishing. Um, I've been able to love being able to do that. Generally speaking, just love the outdoors. I have a great old dog who, uh, if he feels like it at some point, will probably walk behind me. So if you see something, some shadow, just know I'm not being haunted. That's just my old dog uh, flopping down on the floor. Um, but that's me in a nutshell and um, happy to and, and looking forward to getting to know everyone. Joseph, thank you so much. We are so incredibly lucky to have you as part of our team. It actually feels like you've always been part of our team. I can't believe you you said how short a time it's been. So again, to folks who just joined Joseph Dickerson as Sustainable CT's new community partnership manager, and we're so lucky and thrilled to have you on board. Um, we're going to transition now to a different topic that's going to be the subject of the next segment of our meeting. But again, this is very organic and free form. So feel free to interrupt, ask questions and bring the conversation wherever you want. Um, but one thing that we know is that one of the only constants in life is change. And um, in preparing for this, I was reflecting on the fact that whichever town you name as the first incorporated in Connecticut, which could be a different debate for another day. Um, it's, it's, it was in the 1630s that the first Connecticut um, municipality was incorporated. So in, in large time scale, we're coming up upon, um, in another decade, roughly 500 years since Connecticut had towns in their form and they're um, evolving by definition. They outlive and outlast all of us. And um, we just had an election, of course, as you know. So the contours of um, leadership and the individual and residents that live in a town, even in the shorter term, are always changing. And yet the need to promote sustainability and to do the important work that you're all doing is enduring. So that's the paradox. Towns persist. We hope and pray the planet persists. And yet people change. So that's the topic of our conversation today, how to resolve this paradox and what are towns doing to create real depth in the sustainability work across multiple levels of municipal engagement. So how to pull in residents, town staff, leadership um, at all levels, such that even as personalities change, um, that there's continuity. So we recently had our fall certification process. We're delighted that on November 30th, we're going to officially honor the 23 towns that were certified in the fall, as well as additional towns that were certified this past spring at the CCM annual meeting. And we have with us today representatives from two of our silver certified communities, um, both of whom are not new to sustainable CT in a previous certification cycle. They were both bronze and that's New Milford and West Hartford. So we're delighted that they're both here today to do some storytelling for us on, um, on their learning, their process, their trials, their errors, their successes. And then hopefully that can stimulate some more organic dialogue around what you're all doing, um, both in the way of successes and challenges challenges in addressing this idea of continuity. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Julie. Julie, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and New Milford's fabulous work. And then after we hear from New Milford, we're going to hear from Catherine Diveny in West Hartford. So Julie, take it away. And you tell me when you're ready for me to screen share. Will do. Thanks, Alyssa. Um, I'm Julie Bailey, and I'm one of the two co-captains of the New Milford Sustainability Certification Process for 2021. We had a team of 30 people 
And in addition to that, we probably had close to 60 or 70 people who helped us in one form or another. And that was one of the ways that we were able to make sustainability an increasing part of the DNA of our town going forward. We were delighted to be certified silver, but we were even more delighted at the catalytic effect that doing this has had on our town in the broadest possible sense. And the way we did it, first of all, was with a broad-based team. So go ahead, Alyssa. I have a brief, um, a brief PowerPoint. It's about four pages and kind of sums up what we learned as we went along. We took a broad-based team approach. Go ahead to the next one, Alyssa. <clears throat> and the first thing we did was to build a team. When we started out, I had absolutely no idea if our town was capable of doing silver, but I knew that it would be really a positive thing to move forward to doing that. So I um, got in touch with 10 other Connecticut towns and asked them, they were the ones who had gotten silver before and asked them how they had done it and what were the lessons that they learned. And that was an invaluable thing. And as I look back on it now, I'm thinking, my God, we were so totally clueless when we started this thing, that that was the first step that really helped us know what we had to do. And the, the thing that I remember the most was something that the town planner of Greenwich said to me, which was, don't think you can do it with just two people like you did bronze. This is a full-time job. And that is something that we remembered as we went along. The first thing that we did was secure our mayor as the honorary chair of this. And instead of calling him the mayor from then on, we called him the chief obstacle buster and the chief door opener. And every time we had trouble getting something done, whether it was in the town at large, whether it was in terms of municipality, he would make a discreet knock on someone's door, metaphorically speaking. And we were able to get in and get the kinds of things that are on our own, we never would have been able to do. And he actually volunteered for positions. So the first thing I'd say is to make sure that you get someone at a high enough level that can do that for you. Then we identified the co-captains and that sounds like a very formal term for something that was totally informal. Stephen, who is the other co-captain who is not here today and I are neighbors. And when he asked me over drinks one night with um, his house is right next door to mine, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm gonna start this thing called Sustainable Connecticut. And he said, hmm, that sounds really interesting. Maybe I'd like to help you on that. And before long, not just a volunteer did he become, but actually my co-captain on this. And it was good because both of us have very different skill sets and very different expertise. He's an extraordinary marketer. He's extraordinary at social media, at digital issues, at designing things. And what I brought to it was 30 years of nonprofit experience and grassroots efforts in the environment and a number of other areas in our town. So I knew who were the people who had done things both in the municipality and in the town itself who really had a good track record of getting things done because on this kind of an endeavor, you sure don't want any seat warmers. So we then recruited captains for each action. And when you had large ones like well-stewarded land and natural resources, et cetera, or the arts and culture, we would have up to four or five people involved in sub teams that were each led by an action captain. And the thing that was the most important and that started this process of getting this into the DNA of our town was he developed a PowerPoint and we delivered it to any civic or any municipal or any commission organization that would listen to us. And it was during the time of COVID, so it was easy to do, with, um, to do it online. And that was an extraordinary helpful because it surfaced more volunteers and people wanted to know such questions as, well, you know, what is this going to cost the taxpayer? What are the benefits? How long does it take? And what do you think your chances are of doing this? And so crossing our fingers, we delivered all of these presentations and it made a huge difference. And that's how we built the team. The second thing we did was to move into action. Go ahead, Alyssa. And the first thing we did, and probably the most critical piece in the process for us was prioritizing the actions by anticipated workload. And we did it into three sections. And the first one was to gather from those projects that were already done, just the documentation. And the second level was if the project existed but didn't have documentation, how could we get that done? And a good example of that was with the library project, which became a very key piece of historical asset assessments. Um, it's a huge multi-million dollar project that we're doing. And when we called on the consultants who were doing it, the engineering consultants and said, do you have the assessment of what it looked like before? They said, no. And 
the, the, the most extraordinary thing is that the consultant took the weekend and sat down and pulled all of the documents together from the team in the town that had done it and what their company had done it and provided an extraordinary assessment, which was useful for the town going forward, even after the project. The next thing, um, excuse me, I forgot the last one, which is the large ones. Um, those are new and multi-part actions. And I want to tell you to be really careful with this because Stephen and I are extraordinarily enthusiastic and full of energy and thought there was nothing that we couldn't done. So each of us ended up on our own a number of projects that were from scratch, either in the environments or art and culture. And that's what ended up taking most of our time in addition to helping those who were on the team do theirs. But those were the ones that also brought in a lot of town volunteers and a lot of people who hadn't known anything about sustainable um, Connecticut. And so that was useful from a multi impact point of view. Then we assigned the actions to people and it was generally folks who had been chosen for their expertise or their experience in certain parts. And we created a calendar of milestone and submission deadlines. And all of those projects that we started from scratch, we put off until August. And so you can imagine that our August was not spent on a beach in Bali, even if there had been no COVID. We were literally chained to our desks, but it was exciting and it was exuberant. And because of the help and the support of Sustainable Connecticut, and I'll give you a good example for that, we, um, we had something called a portfolio management account for tracking our energy usage in municipal buildings, but nobody knew it existed. And in talking to Alyssa and saying, you know, I'm not sure how to do this. She said, there's this extraordinary woman at UConn who can do it in the School of Engineering. And she, I think was probably in some form, um, maybe um, a consultant to Sustainable Kinetic, but she and her intern within two weeks pulled together our portfolio management account and discovered that we had another one that no one knew about. So she merged both and got it done by the 24th of August. And now we have Eversource letting us know as we begin a very large $15 million project to put solar energy panels on the roofs of our um, schools um, to lower the municipal cost of energy. She, we have um, this objective source that lets us know how far and how fast we're reducing our energy as we work with the consultants. So that's another thing that became part of our DNA. The third thing is we checked in regularly one-on-one -on -one with all of the team captains. And in addition, number four, we Zoomed monthly with all of the people who were involved in doing this. And at each of those, we asked one or two team captains to just deliver a progress report on what was going on and if they had any questions or any needs to put those out among the other group to find out if somebody else could help them with that. We started with a, a committee, um, sorry, we started with a team of maybe 15 people, then it became 20, then it was 25, and then it was 30. And all the way up until the end, we kept adding people as different kinds of expertise were needed. All right, Alyssa. The big issue in the middle of this project for several months was to maintain the momentum. And what we did is we, in a sense, provided the scaffold and it was the people who were the team captains who were able to get those projects organized. And if they needed something, they would call on Steve or me to do it for them. And we allowed a sufficient time for each project to develop and for each captain and team to complete self-assigned actions. And what we would do is fill in the gaps and we would wear multiple hats with them and really do exactly what it was that they needed done. We also, and this took, a, this took more time than we thought it would, we introduced the team to the submission process and we provided examples and we actually developed, Stephen did, a, um, like a form that everybody when they submitted it had to use and it was a uniform thing and this was a suggestion from the town of Glastonbury and it was extraordinary because it meant that when Stephen received everything that he was going to upload, he knew that he had all of the documents and he knew that he had any narrative that he needed, et cetera, et cetera. But as I said, it took us more than one session with the team to really have them understand what the submission process was. And we originally thought that maybe one of the assistants in the mayor's office would be able to do the uploading. But in the end, it was such a, a time-consuming process because Stephen did a lot of editing as we went along. 
And as a veteran of having to rewrite a social equity toolkit four times before it was acceptable to the standards bearer, Stephen, I know how important that was to do. Then we set internal deadlines for the process review and the content refinement. And as I said, we got the easiest ones, the ones that were documented done first, and those were submitted in April or a couple that were actually from start, but didn't require as much effort. And then the ones that took longer, again, we left off toward the end. I would say that this next point is probably the most important thing that we learned, painfully. Assume that things will always take longer than anticipated. So if you have a timeline with milestones that goes up over the year, it really helps you to structure what you need to do when. During this whole process, Stephen used social media to report on town progress to the town throughout the project. We had a Facebook page. Um, the town has a number of Facebook pages on its own. And we used that to let people know what was going on. To the point of view that I knew we had been successful when someone in the town saw me in the supermarket and said, I started, he said, what are you doing? And I told him, he said, oh yeah, yeah. I've heard about that from at least four different sources. Great, keep up the good work. So we knew that we had gotten some depth. All right, Alyssa. What did, the, what did the broad based team approach maximize? It certainly increased exponentially the number of actions that we could do to make it to the finish line. And what is probably the most important point, we had a lot of bench strength in each of the actions. So we had continuity in the event that a team member departed and minim this minimized disruption. And this actually happened in February when the economic development director who had really been our angel and our force of the municipality and the strongest believer from the very beginning in the importance of the impact of doing this for the town of New Milford actually left to accept a job in the private sector. And we wandered around for a week thinking, how are we gonna do this? How are we gonna do this? And then we realized that we had put in place other people who could take over documenting some of the things that she had done and what was going on afterwards. And if we hadn't had that, we would have really missed out tremendously on what the town has done economically. The other thing that this broad-based team approach does is it's a great opportunity for relationship building and partnerships between the municipal staff and the community volunteers. In our town, oftentimes there is sort of a gap between what the town knows and what the municipality thinks the town knows. And the more people who were working closely with partners in the municipality meant that they were developing relationships that long after Sustainable Connecticut is done, they will have the kind of relationship that they can pick up the phone and talk to someone in the municipality and they will know what the context is. We also got an enormous diversity of expertise and voices and points of view and dialogue. And sometimes it was very messy because people in a single sub team or an action team would have different points of view of how to do things. But when we would get together in the meeting, the Zoom with the, all of the people who are involved in this once a month, they would be able to work it out. People would offer ideas, et cetera. And so things tended to flow more smoothly because we had this broad-based team. And finally, you've got a breadth of team network and access to critical pro bono, local, regional, state, nonprofit, and academic expertise. And this for us was a secret and it was really largely thanks to Sustainable Connecticut. I can think of four or five different instances when we were offered opportunities to do things by Sustainable Connecticut, for example, resiliency with the Nature Conservancy. We were honored to be asked to join that. And so we had 23 people come to a three hour workshop that was free to the town. But in the end, what you got from that three hour workshop with a facilitator and his team from was a resiliency report that is now being used to figure out what do we do with climate change, et cetera, et cetera, and how do we ensure the resiliency of our town. Another one was the woman that I told you about, the energy expert at the Yukon. We also turned to Yukon and applied. Uh, I think it was a competitive application, but we applied to get help on doing our brownfield inventory and our map. And they actually decided to give us two projects. This was Yukon. And so we had a number of things that were done for us that really accelerates our ability to renovate and restore our brownfields 
on the riverfront where we're doing a major project of riverfront revitalization. And we're at the very early stages, but this gave us a lot of the documentation that we needed for doing um, grant applications, et cetera, in the future. So in closing, I would say, think big, take on more than you think you can do. Don't hesitate to ask other towns for help. And by all means, create the largest team of mixed municipal and volunteers people in the town that you can do because it certainly pays back a million times. And in the end, I have to say it was really fun now that we've recovered from August 24th. And if you have any questions after this session, please email either Stephen or me and we would be happy to share our expertise with you in thanks in return for what the other towns in Connecticut have done for us. Thanks, Alyssa. Julie, thank you so much. Um, I, I imagine that there are lots of questions and interest and conversation, but I want to bring everyone together into one integrated dialogue. So I'm, I'm going to ask everyone to hold their questions. I'm next going to turn things over to Catherine Diveny of West Hartford. Um, and then Catherine, after your presentation, um, I'd love to open the floor to conversation and dialogue. And in the meantime, I know the chat's lighting up already, but for those who aren't using it at the bottom of your screen, if you click the chat bubble, um, you can ask any questions you want. And I also know we had folks who joined us throughout the presentation. So just to ground everyone who arrived a little late, my name's Alyssa Norwood. We're so glad you're here. We welcomed Joseph Dickerson to our team to um, take the position of of community match fund partner um, or organizer. I think I just made up a new title for you. But um, anyway, Joseph's great. He does everything. So any title works. And um, our topic is about creating sustainable sustainability teams and how to endure change and transition when lasting impact is needed. So with that, Catherine, I'm going to turn it over to you. Hey, <clears throat> can you guys hear me? Thanks, Alyssa. Um, so I wanted to tell you guys that um, actually when Alyssa asked me, can you guys see this? When Alyssa asked me to, can you guys see my slides? Yes. Okay. Looks great. So I wanted to tell you guys when um, Alyssa asked me to present today, I almost said no, because I told her like that West Hartford does not have any of this figured out. We're still <laughs> we're still struggling and evolving. Um, so I told her I could share our journey, but that I didn't think we were a shining example. <laughs> um, so I, I'll throw that out there. Alyssa told me, of course, not to sell myself short. So what I plan to do is, is share kind of some of our journey and some of our, um, you know, what we've done and what we are, have evolved through and what we, what we are looking to in the future. Um, and this is more about our kind of sustainability um, structure and um, committees um, and less about the certification process. And um, Julie, your presentation was fantastic. Um, I wish we had an army <laughs> like you did, but we're working on it. So, um, so the slide you see in front of you is, is, is just kind of a timeline of West Hartford's journey. Uh, you know, I won't spend too much on the early stuff um, we did plan to go for silver in 2020. Um, our, our first bronze certification process back in 2018, when the program was first new, was largely an internal effort. Um, you know, we didn't know what this program was. There was a short timeline towards the certification. So we just kind of looked at what the town had already done that satisfied some of the actions. And, and uh, it was a largely internal effort driven by me, and I forgot to mention, I am the town's energy specialist. So I am a part-time position and I reside in the department, way down in the Department of Plant and Facility Services. So in 2018, we did get our bronze certification. On 2000, in 2020, um, we had planned to go for silver and pull much more of the community into the process, but we put that on hold because of COVID. So in 2021, we resurrected this idea that um, we wanted to kind of expand the certification process and sustainability um, to include more of the community, not just the town approach. So we, we formed a sustainability advisory group um, and their mission was twofold. One, to assist with the, the sustainable um, Connecticut certification process, 
But then a phase two of that commission would, of that group would be to make recommendations to the council for the future. So in 2021, we got our silver certification. Um, I recently learned, um, and this is great, um, we have, our town council has these standing committees. Um, and just a couple of days ago, they renamed one of those standing committees from the Public Works and Facilities Committee to the Public Works Facilities and Sustainability Committee. So we'll revisit that idea a little later, but I'm, I'm glad that the notion of sustainability is kind of taking hold at the council level as well. The blue items on this um, screen are kind of what we're working towards in the future um, that are kind of related to the program. And just again, this idea of ingraining sustainability into the town and especially into its organizational structure. So we are working on actively and hope to pass a climate emergency resolution soon. Um, again, uh, hopefully in January or maybe after budget season in, in kind of March, April, our, our sustainability advisory group, which is affectionately called the SAG, <laughs> um, is going to present the recommendations it's working on to the council. And some of those recommendations might include some structural changes to the town. Um, we're at the town of a West Hartford. Um, does have plans to hire an equity officer position, which will be under the town manager. Um, the job posting should be released pretty shortly. And then we envision kind of ongoing work and hopefully some changes based on the recommendations of our sustainability advisory group um, and looking towards gold certification in the future when it's available. So that's a little bit about our journey. I just wanted to take a deeper dive on this sustainability advisory group that we implemented in the last year for this silver certification round. So um, we've been working on this a while and it actually happened a little later than we had hoped because we didn't pass the resolution until February um, of 2021 um, with the certification um, happening in August, um, the applications being due. But um, we put out, uh, we passed a resolution, we put out a kind of townwide solicitation. We actually stole a lot of that um, language from Manchester, Connecticut, who we had talked to. And I think they would be another uh, town that you could tap for, um, for a great model for a sustainability group. Um, we had a lot of interest, tremendous interest, about 60 people applied to be on this sustainability advisory group and we selected about 30 um, and that included some youth representation. Just a little bit about how we organized that group. Um, it was passed in February. The first meeting didn't happen for various administrative reasons until the end of May. Um, and that group has been meeting, met for the most part virtually. Um, there were a few in-person meetings in the middle there. You but at the, more than I thought. at the first meeting, um, we invited Alyssa in. Um, this was a group of residents, you know, passionate about various aspects of sustainability, but we wanted to give them kind of an intro to the program. So we invited Alyssa in to give her spiel, which was awesome and inspiring. Um, and then one of the first things we did at the meeting the first meeting of this group was we asked everyone um, off the top of their heads, what was their primary sustainability wish for West Hartford? Um, and then we just decided as an exercise, we put all those wishes in a letter and we sent them to town council. And we caveated that letter by saying, you know, this was kind of a brain dump. This was the starting point of the work that this council, this this advisory group was gonna do. And obviously we were gonna come back to them um, in several months time with some formal recommendations, but we wanted to, to distribute that wish list as kind of a starting point. Then the group kind of embarked upon their two phased uh, mission, which was first to do the sustainable Connecticut application. So from May until August, um, I worked as the main staff coordinator. And um, unlike 
Julie's group in New Milford, I would say that I still did a lot of the heavy lifting for West Hartford's sustainable Connecticut silver application. Um, we did utilize uh, our sustainability advisory group, but they were still getting their feet wet on the program and, and what's going on in the town. So we did divide them into groups and I signed them kind of about 15 or so easy actions to work on so that they got a feel for how the program worked, um, what the documentation, how the documentation process worked and all that. Um, but I was the main liaison with the town. Uh, West Hartford was pretty clear that they didn't want you know multiple outside people contacting different department directors for information so i was kind of the gatekeeper for that process um but it worked it worked very well you know there was a lot of heavy lifting on my part um a, a few of the sag members really stepped up um to help as did some uh, some key staff within the town um and we got it got it in successfully and uh, with a great outcome so um so we're pleased with that the SAG now has embarked on its second phase of what it was asked to do. So from August to about January, they're really knee deep. They've divided themselves into groups with, uh, around certain priority, priority areas that, that they would like to see the town work more on in sustainability. Some are climate related, some are complete streets related. Um, these different things. And they're working on slides in these different priority areas, which eventually will be um, presented to town council. So that's happening right now. Uh, the final slide I have is just to share with you, you know, and keep in mind, this is a work in progress. These are some of our thoughts. These are not set in stone, nor is this, you know, <laughs> um, the town of West Hartford's kind of uh, decision yet. So, uh, you know, this is this is just kind of a some work in process that I'm sharing with you guys. So some of our thoughts um, as we look at the future and, you know, some of you guys, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you guys have thought about a lot of these things as well. Um, so it's 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 not new stuff, but it's stuff that we've been struggling with a little bit on how to how to organize correctly around sustainability um, because you know the towns are, have been organized a certain way in the past and maybe it's time to, to change some of that. So some of the ideas that we've come up with is sustainability is central. And for us, as we look and, you know, again, this could be different for, for every town. I think part of this process is understanding your town and what works. We have spent a lot of time talking to other towns, but at the end of the day, you know, we have to make sure that whatever model we endorse fits with our town and how our town works. Um, so for us, we've come up with the idea that sustainability is central and it should really be elevated and belong under the town manager or mayor because it cross cuts many departments. Um, you know, having the, the main coordinator be me, a part-time energy manager, in the plant and facilities department, um, I don't think is doing it justice. So we'd also like to see more top-down leadership on sustainability. And we'd also like to see a more of a connection between what's going on the town side and the board of ed side. And then um, what's come out of our, our sustainability advisory group, you know, we have a lot, just like Julie, a lot of interested, passionate, and very knowledgeable residents. Um, and they would like more clarity on how to work with the town and whom to work with in the town on various things. So what the process is and, and who's, who's working on different things. And then this idea that everything that the town, the council or the Board of Ed does should be screened for sustainability and equity. Um, just a little note on that. So here in West Hartford, we have a, a, in a, a form that it's called an agenda item summary that travels with every resolution or every item that the town council works on. And on that form, it has different reviews. You know, what an op, uh, you know, was this legally reviewed? You know, what's the operational impact? What's the financial impact? And so we are working on adding a sustainability 
review and an equity review to that form so that that would be considered for every agenda item. Um, we are also looking at possibly refreshing some of our commissions. You know, we, I'm sure like many other towns, we have some commissions who are very active and engaged, some are not. Um, some of our commissions are pretty outdated. Their ordinances haven't been resized. We have one that hasn't been resized since 1972. Um, we also have some commissions that were mistakenly not created by ordinance, they were created by resolution. So we're looking at this, not only the, the new changeover in the town council, um, but kind of looking at finding out some of these mistakes. We're looking at these as opportunities to sit down, kind of look at what our commissions are doing, maybe broaden some of their scope, maybe reduce some other scope um, to kind of line up on some sustainability um, issues because we've identified some gaps. Um, we, we in West Hartford, we have no commission that really is responsible for waste or materials management, <laughs> if you can believe it. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it may fit under the scope of some commissions, but it's, it's not actually written anywhere that someone has responsibility for that. And with all the stuff going on in that area and the, and the cost increases and the plants closing, um, that is an area that I feel the town is going to be working in 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 um, over the next few years, pretty heavily. Um, West Hartford, we also um, have been delving into the issue that, and I, I I think some other towns struggle with this too, the difference between commissions and other kind of group <laughs> groups um, and what the requirements around those groups are. So, you know, towns have different tools in terms of the groups they can form in West Hartford and maybe other places too. Our commissions are subject to party affiliation requirements, um, but we do have tools to create other groups. Typically they're temporary, but maybe they don't need to be task forces, councils, work group committees, all these things are interchangeable. Um, right now our commissions are not allowed to have voting student representation on them. Uh, commissions have to be um, electors, so voting members, voting residents of West Hartford. Um, so some of these other models, unless we're going to change that, um, some of those these other models might be might be better um, group structures for us. And then some of the, our other things we're looking at is whether we need additional staff. Um, again, this idea that sustainability belongs under the town manager. Um, you know, I told you our, the town is hiring an equity officer, which will be, I don't know whether that's gonna be the title, but it will be under the town manager. The town manager already has an economic development coordinator under them, as well as our public relations and community engagement group under him. So when I look at that and I think about sustainability and the three E's he's got, economics, the economic development piece. He's got the social equity person. He's got the community engagement and equity people, but he doesn't have anyone in the environmental world or the sustainability world um, in, that, in that central office. So that's something we're looking at. Town of West Hartford also, I think, um, needs some additional help in planning. For a town our size, we have one planner and one associate planner. We have no environmental planners, no transportation planners, um, even just another general planner I think would be good for us. <laughs> so as we think about, um, you know, I mentioned our sustainability advisory group um, that is structured as a temporary group right now. So it will go away um, once it completes its mission of the sustainable Connecticut application phase one, and its second phase of making these recommendations to town council. But we are looking at a next iteration of that group. Um, and our thoughts right now is that it's like, it likely wouldn't be a commission. Um, we're, we're favoring more of a hybrid collaborative working environment. You know, I don't know whether leadership will be part of that, but it will definitely be a combination of staff, residents, students. And that would also allow commissions and organizations. So maybe more of a coalition kind of model. 
we're also thinking about, you know, does that group need kind of an internal lead or chair kind of on the town side, as well as an external lead on the community side um, to engage the residents and, and maybe do some additional outreach. And then we're also looking, thinking about, you know, so the group doesn't get too large, maybe there would be some specific work groups. Um, I mentioned we're passing a climate change, a climate emergency resolution. So some of the outcomes of that are a climate action plan and a greenhouse gas inventory. So we would need some people to actually work on those tasks. And again, I just wanna wrap up saying, we don't know, <laughs> you know, we'll keep at this, we'll keep trying. Um, this is something that's evolving for the town and, and how best to organize um, so that we can make progress on sustainability. That's all I got. Catherine, thank you so very much. Um, I know the chat has been active. So if you don't mind, um, Catherine, stop sharing your screen so that yes. we can all see each other. Um, Gail, if you're there, I know your question popped into the cat chat first, two of them actually. And I know that um, lots of people probably have them in mind. So um, if you could ask them. And the other thing I'll say is we're officially scheduled to go until 11, but for anyone who has the capacity to stay on longer, we'll stay um, as long as there's lively conversation and interested folks here. So um, Gail from Bethany, over to you. Um, yes, we have a couple of questions. We, you know, we're a very, very small town up in the hills just outside New Haven. And um, we had a great deal of support from our first select woman in the past, but then there was a political change. And so we have leadership that um, speaks to us, but doesn't do anything. Um, so uh, my question is, uh, you know, what can we do to encourage participation from the leadership? Um, because basically they're thinking, well, what is this in for us? What, what, what are we going to get out of it? There's, there's this sort of drag that we're dealing with, and we're not sure how to handle that. That's the first question. Catherine and Julie, maybe you can you can tag team um, and share some thoughts based on your experience, and then others are also welcome to chime in based on theirs. Oh, Julie, you're on mute. Go ahead. There we go. I think for us, the critical issue, and it sounds like a bread and butter issue, pretty basic, but to really convince the leadership and the community of the value of this, we first of all had to show them that we absolutely did not use any taxpayer dollars to do this. And number two, the, the results were incredible in terms of our ability to reposition ourselves as a town if we were certified silver. What this would mean for when we went for federal and state grants, et cetera, and to private foundations, that they would see us as resilient and an inclusive and a sustainable town. And that this is very much on the top of everybody's minds right now. And we repeated that message again and again and again, and that came through. And so they understood from the beginning what the value was. And on a very small, very granular level, not very small for us, we raised a total of about $38,000 through three community match um, processes. And when they saw that we were not only doing these things, but we were figuring out how to fund them. And we had some private donations to help us do this. People began to take this seriously. And when we talked to them in those meetings where we, and you wanna have meetings with people in the municipality, as well as the commissions at letting them know what the advantages are that other Connecticut towns had seen in this, that made a huge difference. And we would you know, show them the um, case studies from other towns, et cetera. That was also a very valuable way to do it. Catherine? Yeah, I mean, I would say call someone from Sustainable Connecticut and have them come present to your leadership. Um, they do a fantastic job. And right on their website, they have listed a lot of the benefits to town that are participating in terms of, you know, the, the access to, to the community match fund and some funding. Um, but also just the training and resources, the, the free technical assistance, um, 
and access to those programs. It's, you know, whether it's the nature conservancy thing or the equity coaching, I mean, that's, that's hugely valuable as well as the ability to collaborate and network with other towns. Um, I, I think if you tap into some of, and it's all written up on the sustainable Connecticut website, I think in their pamphlet, they go through some of the benefits um, to participating in the program. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would tap into some of that. I don't, we didn't face a lot of resistance um, to the concept, you know, uh, when it when it comes to actually doing the work, you kind of have to pull some people along, um, but but not not in in concept. Gail, do you have a town council that would be willing to have you do a presentation to them on what the benefits to the town would be? Um, well, we have a board of selectmen, which is the basically the council, um, the town council. Um, Generally, there's a great deal of apathy. Um, they also are very locked into a belief system and um, that town taxes were paid for uh, solar panels and they, we can't shake the pervasive myth that this was actually not funded by the town at all. So we got this kind of very entrenched mindset mm -hmm. and it's difficult to break through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that leads me to this next question, which is, you know, from other towns experiences, is there an advantage to be the official town committee? Because we were appointed by the town to be a, a um, ad hoc committee, or would it be better if we positioned as an independent entity? Or a combination of, the, we, we're trying to position uh, so that we can have more efficacy. We have a very strong, grassroots support from folks. Um, we have a monthly bulletin and I do a little blog every month and people follow that. So, you know, with us about 5,000 people in town, they read that and I'm so very careful with writing. There is a lot of interest, um, but it's just getting people out of their doors. <laughs> I think what happens in our town a lot is that this um, kind of excited base of people about issues and things that has a long history of work in the town and in the community. Getting together with the town and working together on this kind of thing, and this in a sense, a mixed partnership has made a huge difference in the understanding, I would say on the part of the municipality and some of the departments on the importance of this and seeing that they have help from the grassroots that you know, on, on, on the basic level of doing this, makes a huge difference because a number of towns think, oh my God, this is a huge thing to take on. So my, my vote would be for a mixed committee of folks from the town together with folks from the municipality. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I, I just told you in my presentation that that's kind of where we're, we're ending up. We, we've tried it both ways, but again, my, my advice is what works in one town is, is not what works in another town. So, you know, don't let, don't get analysis paralysis worrying about how it's gonna happen. Like <laughs> just go forward and, and you know, change as, as you go. You can evolve if it's not working, um, you know, it, nothing, nothing is set in stone, right? And guys on the call, I, I'm sure you guys have, have experience too. So feel free to answer these questions too. It doesn't just have to be Julie and me. Catherine, thanks for that invitation. Yeah, don't be shy, speak up. You're all not just here as participants, um, you're, you're experts as well. So please share your learning with everyone. Alyssa, there's another question that came in from um, Cornwall. I can't see the first name, Kathy or Catherine. A very good one, which is along the same lines, you know, the typical small town scenario and how do you convert a municipally based program to a citizen base? I'd love to hear a little bit more about what she has to say about that. If I may interject, uh, I'd like to go back to uh, some of Gail's comments from Bethany. Uh, you do live in a beautiful town. I used to have occasion to go through there on a regular basis and uh, wonderful people. And uh, you, you, you forget how close you are to New Haven because it's like in another world. <laughs> um, in Pomfret, we dug around for three years 
and just couldn't get past the first base because uh, everyone tried to eat that elephant in one bite. You just can't do it. Uh, but then we kind of took a different tact and uh, we just took off a little bit of chunks at, at each cycle. And uh, there's nothing to succeed like success. So you take a little victory and you grow from there. We looked at um, EVOs. And next thing you know, uh, on economic development, we're talking to the Board of Selectmen and the um, Planning and Zoning about maybe changing some regs in town so that when homes are being built, they're built EVO capable. And uh, cause that's the wave of the future. And you can save 85% on your installation charge if you do it at the build phase, as opposed to retrofitting once the house is built. Um, people, ADUs are becoming a buzzword. I used to call them my in-law apartments, but uh, Pomfret now has a zoning regulation. It's one of the first in the country to uh, allow for ADUs, whether they're attached or detached. And uh, the, the, uh, the language has been put in place. We're very proud of what we've done there. And we're a little town with just a bunch of volunteers. And we didn't have 60 volunteers. We didn't have 30 volunteers. The first selectman said, Charlie, if you want to do it, go for it. And uh, so we had one guy acting like 60, but thanks to Torn, thanks to Jess, thanks to a couple of volunteers uh, that were interns with the Sustainable CT, we were able to achieve bronze status this year. And for a small town in Northeast Connecticut, not too many people have heard of, uh, I think everyone pitched in and did a great job. And we looked not so much at the form of creating sustainable CT, but what the end results were gonna be. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't get hung up on, well, this person should do this or this person should do that so we can achieve a sustainable CT. We looked at the end results. And another thing that I'm very proud of is it, it's not a it wasn't a requirement for 2021, but uh, working with the unhoused population is in the criteria moving forward. And we said, well, if it's gonna be there, let's tackle it now. And uh, as a result of that, we have been, um, we're one of the first communities that has the 211 access number on the homepage for our town website. And we are now working with the local access agency. And yesterday we dropped off a, a station wagon full of uh, sheets and towels and toothpaste and it's, it's the right time of year to get that to these folks. And they were, they were out of supplies, but they had a fresh supply of homeless people that needed them. So uh, those are the things that I see sustainable CC, sustainable CT working for. And Gail, if you could have a couple of wins like that and get the people to transition from being naysayers to being on board with your efforts, I think you can get a lot done. Okay, thank you very much. We're certainly going to take this and, and uh, digest it and see if we can reposition uh, because what currently is working is not working. <laughs> <laughs> and, and let them think it's their idea. <laughs> yeah, good point. Good point. <laughs> thank you very much, Charlie. Yeah. Thank you all so much for sharing. I um, For folks who aren't following the chat, I also just want to direct you. I know Karen from Cheshire had to hop off, but in this spirit of different models of sustainability teams. So Cheshire formed the Coalition for a Sustainable Cheshire. It's an independent nonprofit group that worked in collaboration with the official town group. So there are lots of different models out there. Um, I also want to remind folks that we have a relatively new action in our program that encourages mentoring, receiving mentorship, um, mutually supporting each other um, to, to do this work across the region. So not only can you get expertise from your peers, you can earn points and future certification for doing so. Um, as we approach 11 o'clock, the last question I wanna lift up is Catherine, there's a lot of interest in the process that you mentioned around the town integrating sustainability potentially um, into its review, that checklist that you mentioned. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that document and if it might be possible um, for us after the coffee hour to share it with the, the broader group. Yeah, I just put in the chat that I'll, I'll send a link um, to that. Um, so that's not a done deal, but, um, but I, 
I think it'll get there. So this, this is not a, this is a informal form that's um, being used by the town council just to, um, to kind of uh, help because they have a lot on their agenda. So, so if there's a big resolution or something like that, um, this, this form that was created, I think by the town manager, um, which just has a little bit of the background. And like I said, some of these different reviews um, listed, I'll, I'll, I'll share it with you guys, but it, it goes along with that resolution so that the counselors can kind of get up to speed. Um, and like, and you know, it, the form was not created by the council. So I don't think anything, um, anything formal will be needed to change that form. Um, and I think they're looking just to, to ensure that people know what goes in these additional fields if we add a sustainability review um, or an equity review, we were also maybe going to, and this is a work in progress again, like what, what do we add to that form? We were thinking maybe a check box says, that says, is this consistent with the POCD, our plan of conservation and development? You know, just to tie those planning documents into the, the decision-making process as well. Um, this idea that you know, in this day and age, there are certain additional screens that maybe towns haven't thought about. And on the equity piece too, we're thinking about, you know, well, that needs not only to be a review of, you know, equity in terms of the outcome, but equity in terms of the process. Like how did this get on the council? And was there a, a process um, that, that helped shape this resolution as it's, as it's coming up? for a vote. Thank you. So we're, we're just past 11 o'clock. There's always more opportunity for more conversation, but we will be here again next month. And so we hope moving into 2022 to continue this dialogue. Thank you all so much for your continued passion, um, participation, inspiration. And before we sign off, are there any burning last thoughts or questions? Okay, well, wishing you all a wonderful weekend. Looking forward to following up. Um, if you signed in, that means you registered. So we'll, um, we'll send an email with the items that we promised to share. And I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye, and everyone. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Take care.